Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Good morning. Welcome to this Easter morning service here at Slackwood Presbyterian Church. Whether you're here with us in our sanctuary or you're joining us online, we are so, so glad and delighted that you're here with us to celebrate the resurrection and the new life that we have in Jesus Christ. A few announcements before we begin our worship together. The rose you'll see here on the chancel is in honor of Emmett Page, who was born recently to Lindsay Stevens and Adam Grabowski, beloved friends of uh, the church and members of our family. Uh, I understand that they're watching online. Please know, Lindsay and Adam, that we join you with joy in celebrating the new life of little Emmett. And we can't wait to meet him. <laughs> Uh, I would like to express our uh, thanks on behalf of the congregation for our own Debbie Moore for leading us in our music this morning. Our director of music, Dr. Shelley Sanders Zuckerman, is currently traveling to Florida to be with her father. He is uh, unfortunately is in poor health due to his melanoma, and so we want to extend our prayers to Dave, uh, to Shelley, to Sydney and ask for traveling mercies for Shelly and Tara as they go to be with him. Other announcements that you'll find in, uh, your, uh, you will find in your bulletin. I would uh, commend those announcements to you. You also find information about coming events at our website, slackwoodchurch.org. Are there any other announcements that we would like to share this morning? Yes. Yeah, our one and only great grandson turned one on the 13th. <laughs> so, congratulations, Carol, your great grandson turning one year old on the 13th. <clears throat> Wonderful milestone. Yes, Mark. Uh, immediately after worship service today, there will be an Easter egg hunt for the, for the kids and for the, for the adults, too. For those adults that are uh, young at heart. So. And uh, I've been informed that there's a, uh, a golden egg. So if that's an enticement for a, a Bible event. I don't know what the reward is for finding them, but uh, that's how it is. So immediately after worship. Thanks. So thank you for that, Mark. Uh, there will be a, an Easter egg hunt uh, immediately after worship in uh, our backyard for our young people and for all of those who are young at heart. And there are not one, not two, not three, not four, but Five golden eggs. <laughs> so be on the lookout for those. Are there any other announcements to share this morning? Yes, Shirley. Uh, Morgan and I uh, celebrated our 13th wedding anniversary yesterday. Congratulations. <laughs> Maureen and Shirley on your 13th anniversary. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Any other announcements to share this morning? In that case. Whether this is your first time in our sanctuary or you've been here too many times to count, whether you're coming from across the street, across town, across the river, across the country, across the world, whether you're here in one of these well-worn pews or you're watching us over the internet, know that you are truly welcome in this place. Christ is alive. Alleluia. Let us worship God. <coughs> Good morning. Please join me in the call to worship printed in the bulletin. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. God's steadfast love endures forever. I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. This is the Lord who is and it is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice in God. Let us pray. Glory to you, O God. You have won victory over death, raising Jesus from the grave and giving us eternal life. Glory to you, O Christ. For us and for our salvation, you overcame death and open the gate to everlasting life. Glory to you, O Holy Spirit. You lead us into the truth. Glory to you, O Blessed Trinity. 
now and forever. Amen. Christ himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that free from sin, we might live for righteousness. Trusting in God's grace, let us confess our sins before God and one another, first using the prayer of confession printed in the bulletin, then in silence as we make more personal our prayers to God. Let us pray. Almighty God, in raising Jesus from the grave, he shattered the power of sin and death. We confess that we remain captive to doubt and fear, bound by the ways that lead to death. We overlook the poor and the hungry and pass by those who mourn. We are deaf to the cries of the oppressed and indifferent to calls for peace. We despise the weak and use the earth your name. Forgive us, God of mercy. Help us to trust your power to change our lives and make us new, that we may know the joy of life abundant, given in Jesus Christ, the risen Lord.
Amen. Hear this good news from scripture. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wines, of rich food filled with marrow, of well-aged wines strained clear. And he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples, the sheet that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. Beloved, believe the promise of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Alleluia. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. The first scripture lesson comes from Isaiah, chapter 65, verses 17 through 25. For I am about to create new heavens and a new earth. The former things shall not be remembered or come to mind, but be glad and rejoice forever in what I am creating. For I am about to create Jerusalem as a joy and its people as a delight. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and delight in my people. No more shall the sound of weeping be heard in it or the cry of distress. No more shall there be in it an infant that lives but a few days, or an old person who does not live out a lifetime. For one who dies at a 100 years will be considered a youth, and one who falls short of a 100 years will be considered accursed. They shall build houses and inhabit them, they shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build and inha another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For like the days of a tree shall the days of my people be. And my chosen shall live long and enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain or bear children for calamity. For they shall be offspring blessed by the Lord and their descendants as well. Before they call, I will answer. While they are yet speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox, but the serpent, its food shall be dust. They shall not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountains, says the Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This morning, the choir is going to be singing Holiday, Hallelujah. And we'd love it if you would like to join us. You can find it in the hymnal on page 591. We will do three verses and a chorus before and after each of the verses. And if you'd like to join us for the last two choruses, that would be super.
Hallelujah. Amen. Our second scripture lesson this morning comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, the first 18 verses. Listen again for the word of the Lord. Early, on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and she went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the, the one who Jesus loved, and said to them, they've taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they've laid him. Then Peter and the other disciple set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrapping, wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there, and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but folded, rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in. He saw and believed, but as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. So then the, the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary, but Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying one at the head and one at the feet they said to her ma'am why are you weeping she said to them they've taken away my Lord and I do not know where they have laid him when she had said this she turned around and saw Jesus standing there but she didn't know that it was Jesus Jesus said to her, Ma'am, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you've laid him and I'll take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned to him and said into Hebrew, that is Aramaic, Rabboni, which means my teacher, Jesus said to her, don't hold on to me because I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go, go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and to your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said all these things to her. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. It is such a joy to be back here in our sanctuary on Easter morning, having all of you here with us in person and through the gifts of technology with all of you who are watching us on your laptops, tablets, and phones. I would invite all of us to one more time share that ancient greeting of Easter. So the recap, one person says, Christ is risen. The other person says, he is risen indeed. And then everyone says, Alleluia. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Another beloved tradition of Easter Sunday, in those years when the John story of the resurrection is read, is guessing what tone the preacher is going to put into Jesus' mouth when he gets to the part where Jesus says Mary's name and she recognizes him. It's been my experience that it's usually male preachers who struggle with this and who come up with some of the weirder renditions. For instance, there's the powerful basso profundo voice, perhaps inspired by those technicolor Bible epic movies of the last century. Mary, 
<laughs> Hearing that booming sound, no wonder poor Mary is so startled she forgets her Greek and slips back into Aramaic. Rabuli! <laughs> There's the disappointed father voice, as if Mary's brought home a bad report card. Mary, I don't like that one, but not as much as I dislike this next one. There's the irritated teacher voice, as if Mary is talking in class and he's trying to, to get her to stop. Mary, there's better is the parent waking up the child for school voice. Mary. <laughs> There's also the, the Broadway voice, which leaves you imagining Jesus having to use jazz hands for a flourish. Mary. <laughs> I've always imagined it a little bit more subtle, but full of the joy that Jesus has seeing his friend after it looked like they might not ever be able to see each other again. Mary. How'd I do? Well, as is usually the case with these sorts of things, it's probably best to let Jesus speak for himself and to let Mary speak for herself. In the Greek text of John, Jesus is quoted speaking to Mary first in Greek very formally. There's a woman, or better yet, ma'am, why are you weeping? She's quoted responding in Greek as she's not quite understanding what happened. In that original text, Jesus switches from the Greek version of her name to the Hebrew Aramaic version of her name. He calls her Maryam. When she hears her voice spoken by her teacher in the language of her heart, she responds in that same language, Rabuni, my teacher. All four Gospels tell the same story of the empty tomb on Easter morning, and all four say that women were the first ones there and the first ones to see the empty tomb. Now, Matthew, Mark, and Luke don't specify that it was Jesus at the tomb, but they're mysterious beings who give the ladies instructions to be the first ones to tell the disciples the good news. John, as he usually does, tells it a little bit differently. John zooms in on one woman in particular, Mary, the woman from the place called Magdala, Mary, whom Jesus cast out seven demons and who became one of his closest disciples, following him to the foot of the cross and to the tomb itself after most of the men ran and hid. Mary Magdalene, as she's presented to us in the Gospels, as a woman of courage, of insight, and she is absolutely critical to the proclamation of the gospel, and thus for the formation of the church. This seems to have been a bit too much for some of the leadership of the church over the first millennium, almost all of whom were men. Gregory the Great preached in the homily of the sixth century that that anonymous woman who was a sinner, the one who washed Jesus' feet with her tears back in Luke, well, she had to be Mary Magdalene, even though the Bible doesn't uh, say that woman's name. It doesn't even say that that woman's sin was. It's Gregory who claims that that woman's sin had to have been something sexual in nature and that her name had to be Mary Magdalene. Honestly, that's a bit insulting to both women, but that double slur stuck for centuries and you still see it in art and music today. Movies, too. So, greatest story ever told, Jesus Christ Superstar, Last Temptation of Christ, Passion of the Christ, they've all got some kind of variation on that theme of Mary Magdalene the Adulteress. Again, that's not what the Bible says, so theologians and movie makers have to stretch it a little bit to get there. In the New Testament, what's important about Mary Magdalene's past is that she was healed by Christ himself and that she dedicated herself, her whole life, to him and the good news. She was faithful to the end of his life and faithful beyond the end. Some biblical scholars, you know the type, 
wonder about that little foot race at the beginning of today's story that it seems out of place for a story that's otherwise so focused on Mary and Jesus. And so gallons of scholarly ink have been spilled speculating about that sudden appearance and disappearance of those two male disciples. What's more to the point in the story as we read it in our Bibles is that Peter and the other disciple are really kind of a sideshow. They're no more the central characters in this part of the Easter morning story than the two angels are. Our focus, John's focus, is on the risen Christ and on the recognition that he is alive. Jesus is the central figure of that story of life conquering death. And so Mary is the central figure of the story of the rest of humanity learning that marvelous truth and sharing it. We see the risen Christ through the eyes of Mary Magdalene. And what a privilege that is. John tells us that on Good Friday, Mary Magdalene was there at the foot of the cross, standing next to Jesus's mother, Mary, as Jesus, near death, tells his mother and his closest disciple to take care of each other as adopted mother and son. I imagine Mary Magdalene standing there, looking between the three, her eyes watering from the dust, from the glare of the sun on that bare hilltop, and the tragedy of it all. Then John tells us on Easter morning, it was still dark when Mary Magdalene came to the tomb. I imagine her walking the streets of the Jerusalem carefully, eyes down, scanning the dark street and the dirt paths to avoid tripping. She then lifts her eyes to the tomb, squinting to see, is the stone cover really missing? And her eyes go wide as she realizes it's true. As she runs back to the other disciples, she kicks up sand and dirt, but she just flicks it away with her hand, wiping it away, not slowing down for a second. John tells us that Mary returns to the tomb, that now her eyes are freely flowing with tears. On the surface level, her tears are about her fear that grave robbers have taken away her rabbi's body. But there's a lot more to it than that. Mary's tears come from a variety of places. Her raw grief at the violent death of her friend, at her despair at what must seem like the ignominious end of the ministry of good news that started back in Galilee, her anger at those men in power who tortured and killed her teacher, her confusion about what comes next for her and her fellow disciples. As I was thinking about what I might preach on this Easter Sunday, I was reflecting on just how Lent-y this past Lent has been. The brutal Russian invasion of Afghanistan began just a couple of days before Ash Wednesday. And while remembering my friend's family in, in Kyiv, as I drew the smudgy black cross on people's foreheads saying, to dust you shall return, that hit hard. Reminders coming up in our Facebook memories of those posts from two years ago when we were wondering just how bad is this pandemic gonna be? How long do you think it'll last? Singing, were you there when they nailed him to the tree? Just after Congress, after a century's delay, finally passed the Emmett Till Anti-Lynching Act. That song echoed with the collected horror of the memory of thousands of our black siblings lynched in this country. And then, on Tuesday of Holy Week, while we were still picking up palm fronds and setting the communion table, shots rang out in a New York subway station. It all made me to reflect that this Easter is one of those strange Easters. It's full of joy. There's a lot of sadness too. The phrase that kept coming to my mind was, 
that it seems so odd to say, he is risen indeed, alleluia, when you still have the taste of ashes in your mouth. But Mary Magdalene shows us through the honesty, the intensity of her tears, that weeping is a faithful response to the resurrection. Tears of grief, tears of anger, tears of exhaustion, and yes, tears of joy are as much a part of Easter as laughter and song. Those things aren't mutually exclusive. And our sister, Mary Magdalene, shows us the way. Mary's tears, Mary's shock, Mary's love for her rabbi all give her the strength to go and proclaim to the disciples. She is literally the first human being to share the good news that Jesus Christ has risen from the dead. In the early church, they honored her with the title Apostle to the Apostles for this very reason. And her earth-changing ministry shines through the centuries, even as some guys have tried to obscure her. There are, fortunately, the classic hymns of the church that help capture the importance of Mary Magdalene to the story, giving her the respect she hasn't always gotten from theologians over the centuries. Many come from the African-American spiritual tradition, which frequently feature Mary Magdalene as a hero for her zeal, for her tenacity, the way she is a model of strength, even in grief. Sister Mary came in running, the stoned and roll away. Another musical setting of this story is that of the classic gospel song, In the Garden, which was written by New Jersey native C. Austin Miles in 1912. Now the song is very much of its time, and there are a lot of pastors and church musicians who avoid it because they think it sounds a bit schmaltzy, and the romanticism of some of the verses can seem over the top while the dew is still on the roses. There are a number of my colleagues who silently roll their eyes when In the Garden is mentioned. But I will never forget a piece of advice I got from Reverend Jan Ammon, the minister of the chapel at Princeton Seminary. Jan always reminds us seminarians of the context of the song. In the Garden is an Easter hymn, and it's all about giving voice to Mary Magdalene. Miles said he envisioned himself in Mary's place, weeping as suddenly Jesus' own verse, so sweet the birds hush their singing. Jan's advice to us seminarians is to never forget how important this song of the heart is to so many people, and often for very personal reasons that pastors will never fully know. So treat that song with respect and grace. I'd only add to Jan's sage advice that what this song does in its own romantic, be schmaltzy way, is to finally let us experience the full scene through Mary's eyes. That song takes that sudden exclamation of Mary in the language of her heart, Rabboni, and turns it into a three-verse poem of love and relief and grace. That song captures, in other words, the moment that Easter tears of grief become Easter tears of joy. Several years ago, a friend of mine experienced a stroke. By happy accident, she happened to be in the waiting room of a doctor's office when it happened, so the staff knew what was happening and had her whisked to the hospital to get treatment right away. Even so, a stroke is a very frightening experience, and she still had a long road ahead of her as she went underwent therapy to regain her mastery of speech again. I went down to see her a couple days afterwards, and we had a lovely conversation. As always, she immediately asked about my family, checking in on my mom because the two of them are buddies. I could tell that my friend was having a lot of trouble getting 
the correct words to come out, and about every fourth or fifth word, something just wouldn't come out right. She was getting a little frustrated, understandably. So I told her about a Sunday worship service that we had here at Slackwood. This had to have been about a week or two after Easter. The choir had just sung in the garden. And I asked my friend if she knew it. Her eyes lit up. She gathered her words for a second and said, Buster, you better believe I know that song. I love it. <laughs> so I slowly began to sing in my creaky baritone. I come to the garden alone. And she sang with me. I was having to read the words off my cell phone, but she was singing it out of her heart. Every word, every note was perfect. Even as her brain was trying to rewire itself so she could speak clearly again, her heart sang her soul's song. We delighted in that song together. And the nurses passing in the hall slowed down a little and nodded in time with the waltz. We came to the end of the song and both of our eyes were tearing up. And the joy we share as we tarry there, none other shall ever know. We finished that song and smiled together. It was time for me to go. She needed rest. She had a full day of therapy ahead of her. But together, in the words of that song, she sang perfectly. We both felt the presence of the risen Christ. She's felt a number of health issues and challenges since then, and it's been tough for her. But I know that he walks with her. He talks with her and he tells her she is his own. All of us who call her, who visit her, who write her, we remind her of this and it's given her enormous strength to carry on. My friend is one of the strongest women that I have ever known in my life. I know she's hearing me say this and she's scoffing but it's true. She gets that strength from deep within herself, from her beloved sister, from her family, from her many, many, many friends at Slackwood and in the community. But most of all, she gets that strength from her beloved savior, her teacher, her rabbi, Jesus Christ, who calls her by name and she recognizes him. Our sister walks a path blazed for us by our sister Mary Magdalene a long time ago. Mary, who teaches us that it is faithful to weep and to cry on Easter. Mary, who teaches us that it's okay to be confused and startled on Easter. Mary, who teaches us just as she taught those male disciples that on the third day Christ rose again from the dead, ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. The music might sound a bit old-timey, and the poetry a uh, little over the top. But to sing in the garden on Easter Sunday is a privilege for us in that it gives us the chance, it's the whole congregation of God, of every gender, every age, every walk of life, to relive the Easter story through Mary Magdalene's eyes, to feel the Easter miracle with all the emotional intensity that Mary felt. And so, to connect us with all the generations of the saints who've loved this song and who proclaimed the message that Mary first shared. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.
Amen. Please be seated. As we offer our morning prayers to the risen Christ, I would invite you to join me in the response. When I say, in your mercy, respond, hear our prayer. Living God, in your mercy, hear, hear our prayer. prayer. Living, loving God, we offer our prayers through Christ, who is risen from the dead, who lives and reigns forever, who prays for us in heaven. Through Christ, we pray for the church, for the church universal, carrying out the command you gave the disciples to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them everything that you have instructed us. We pray for the Presbyterian Church USA, for our sister congregations in the Presbytery of the Coastlands, that in this corner of your kingdom we may proclaim your good news and carry out your good works and be a shining beacon of your salvation in this place. Let us be people of joy, living witnesses to the power of the resurrection and the good news of your grace and peace. Living God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Through Christ, we pray for the earth. We pray for this planet you have entrusted to our care at creation. May we use its resources responsibly, share its abundance justly, so that no one goes without. We pray for those who are affected by natural disasters, by wind, rain, fire, and flood, that you would give them hope and help them to rebuild and help us to be those who are rebuilders of ruins with them, to give them hope and courage. From the dust of damaged earth, raise up your new creation full of beauty, wonder, and glory, living God, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. Through Christ, we pray for all nations. We pray particularly for the people of Ukraine as they face the violence, the destruction, the loss of invasion. We pray that you would bring peace to that land, turn swords into plowshares and spears into pruning hooks, and may your justice roll down like waters, righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. We pray for our nation, for its leaders, for this presidents and Supreme Court justices, members of Congress, all of the leadership in our states and our localities, that they would seek to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with you, God. That everything they do may be with justice and righteousness. Let the message of your saving power spread throughout the world. The dominion of death is no more. Living God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Through Christ, we pray for this community, for this beloved Slackwood Church, for all of those whom we love and care for, for all of our family who are near and far. Let the doors of this church be open wide as we go forth in love and service, and let others come in knowing that they will always find a home. Living God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Through Christ, we pray for loved ones, for those who are lifting up songs of joy and praise and gratitude, for those who are seeking your guidance. We pray particularly for Tony, for Jenny, for Ruth, for Jonathan. Be to them as the pillar of cloud by day and fire by night. Guide them, show them your way, and let them know that we walk alongside them, praying for them. We pray for those who are going through difficult times, for those who are ill of body, of mind, or spirit, for those who are weeping, for those who are mourning, for those who are frightened, for those who are tired. We lift up prayers this morning for Harold, for Kyle, Camille, Sharon, Charlie, Faith, Jill, Ebby, Dolores, Janine, Laura, Vince, Maggie, 
Bill, Beth, Carla, Aaron, Terry, Donna, Layla, Jack, Jonathan, Arlene, Marilyn, Mylan, Mary Beth, Leela, Jean, Carolyn, Kim, Jack, Jimmy, Nancy, and Dave. We lift up all these prayers to you. They may be like incense before you. We lift up these names to you. We lift up the names that are on our hearts. And especially, O oh Lord, we lift up those names known only to you. Grant them healing. Grant them courage. Grant them strength. Grant them peace. And help us to be your agents of healing, courage, hope, and peace for them. Give hope to those who wait for good news. Turn their mourning into dancing, their sorrow into joy. Living God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of all power and glory, receive these prayers and continue your mighty work among us. Through Jesus Christ, our living Lord, the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The psalmist says, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and all who live in it. God has been so generous to each of us in many different ways, and so it is only appropriate that we return a portion out of our time, out of our talent, out of our treasure to Almighty God to carry out God's mission and work in this place. We invite you as you are able to make your morning offerings. Our ushers will be passing the plate here. For those of you who are worshiping with us online, you can make your offerings using the church website, slackwoodchurch.org, or mail your offering to the church at 2020 Brunswick Avenue, Lawrenceville, New Jersey, 08648. We thank you for your generosity, and to God be the glory. Let us now receive the morning offering. Let us pray. 
God who's giving knows no ending. Take these, our gifts, our gifts of our time, our talent, and our time. Take them, use them, multiply their effects. Let use them for the glory of your name, for the mission that you've set us out to undertake in this world. And may everything we do be to the glory of the name of our risen Christ. Amen. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord and one another. <laughs> 